Hi everyone, a quick note before we launch into today's video. Applications for CADA 5 of our IPSA professional training course are now open for start in September 2022. If you feel that you have a calling towards depth psychology or psychotherapy and would like to train professionally under Steve and Pauline Richards in psychosystems analysis, then you are more than welcome to apply. We really look forward to reading your application. Check the link in the description and pinned comment for the application webpage. Thanks everyone. Now, on to the video. Okay, hi. <laughs> hi, Professor. Lovely to see you. Yes, great to see you too. Uh, so, my idea for, for today um, was to kind of give, give you an update um, for the for the channels for Young to Live By for Imaginarium. Uh, kind of give you an update on what's going on um, in terms of the biological theory of archetypes that I've been working on for so long, you know. Yeah. Um, and uh, just to kind of, you know, compare and contrast and, and give some of the common objections that's been in the literature for a while. Um, I, I think we're making a lot of progress, actually, in this. Um, I know when Anthony Stevens first came out, there was a lot of pushback with his theory. And, um, you know, his theory was very pioneering. It was, it was raw, you know, it was, it was, uh, but it was uh, very powerful. Um, and since then, there's been a lot of objections and so forth. And I think over, over the years, I've, I've tried to um, respond to those objections, point out where they don't make any sense and point out where they do make sense and help to refine the theory over time, you know. Um, I think so, you've done a wonderful job with that, absolutely. Um, well, it's ongoing, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and as Paul and I have said before, I mean, we obviously had contact with Anthony Stevens right at the beginning of the year 1990. Mm -hmm. And I would say without hesitation that you're his natural successor in this field. There's no question about that, that you, your work is of such high quality and of value to the whole of this field. And it's well, a thank you. great honour for us to be, to be collaborating and working with you. Yeah, I, I um, I'm not sure what Anthony's up to these days. I haven't heard from him in a while, and I know he was not in great health last I talked to him a couple of years ago. So, um, you know, maybe he's just resting and and enjoying his retirement. Um, but he he kind of conveyed that to me as well that he felt that I was kind of carrying on the work, and I and I very proudly you know said thank you for that. You know, so I'm very pleased to do that. Um, I wanted to kind of start off though with something that you guys have been talking about for a long time. And that is that the idea of the self being, you know, correlating with the genome, um, right? So like the self kind of is the genome. I don't want to say it, re it reduces down to the genome because that's a mistake, but um, it's the, the, the genome would be the biological substrate of the self. Would you say that's accurately? Yeah, I mean, the way that we'd worked our uh, conception of it through really was, a, I think, a necessary consequence of George Engel and Anthony Stevens, um, that it had to be that way. And as we pushed the idea of an informational model uh, for, for the psyche, then we considered it as the psychological self, as we would call it, Jung's conception of it, to be a projection into psychology of the genome. And if there were such a thing, it would look exactly like that, probably. The yeah, we, we, right. Because like what you're saying is um, in many cases, I think with Jung, since he didn't know much about genetics, yeah. um, and I've heard you talk about this before, that he, you, to, to your perspective, he psychologized it so much that he kind of reduced it almost to psychology yeah, and kind of forgot about the genetic aspect because, you know, because he didn't know about it that much. Yeah. He had that much choice. But now that we do know about the genome a lot more than Jung did. We can say, okay, if we're gonna con if we're gonna make that connection, I think it's a valid connection completely. But that has a lot of implications, and there's a lot of work to be done there because we know so much about the genome, and nowhere near as much about the self, I would think. Um, but one, you know, informs the other. So when we learn about the genome, we learn about the self. Yeah. Right. So as is, we understand how sophisticated the genome is and how um, just complex and, and flexible and, and powerful and ancient the genome is, 
Well, that applies, wouldn't you say, to the self as well, and helps us characterize how the self would appear before conscious uh, ego, for the, before the conscious ego. Right? Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. So um, rather than just sort of um, maybe hyper-spiritualize it into its divine entity, not that there's anything necessarily or per se wrong with that, because spirituality is real too, but... Um, I, you know what I'm saying? I mean, it's, it's oh, yeah. kind of easy to do that and to kind of lose track and, and um, turn it into this rarefied thing that floats up into the heavens. And, you know, you don't, everyone forgets it. It's made of blood and guts and dirt and grime and all of that stuff <laughs> uh, right down into the bones, you know? Yeah. I mean, you can't do that biology. If we remove that, there's nothing. It may not be everything, mm -hmm. but without it, there's nothing. Right. <laughs> yes. It's uh, necessary, but not sufficient, I think would be yeah. a philosophical way of putting it. Yeah, yeah. And then so the way that we look at it now really is uh, an informational waveform model where different aspects of the whole are represented at specific levels of resolution. Mm -hmm. Obviously, biology, and, and there are several levels within that. Um, psychology, the idea of, of making it a religious I you know, icon as well. You're right that, that obviously that that works uh, for a lot of people, but it's not only at that level of resolution. It's at several simultaneously. So we right. were superposition at several different levels of register. Yes, right. Uh, in a wide bandwidth, bandwidth, as it were. Yeah, and our perception collapses this into representation, and we can make a decision about that and say, well, I'm going to take a religious perspective. Someone else will say, I will take a reductive biological perspective. But they're, they're present. All these levels are present simultaneously, whether right. we choose to be aware of them or not. And that's the difference between the collapse of the wave function in quantum mechanics and the way we think of the collapse of the wave form in our approach, because the waveform is simply the amplitude and the frequency of representation across Engel's biopsychosocial stack. Mm. So it'll be a highlight at one place, and then there'll be a trough, and then there'll be another highlight, but then it's say amplitude and frequency change over time. But that's just where yeah. the information is resonant at any one time, but they all have to be there. So... Um, yeah, and looking at it like that is sort of like saying that the biopsychosocial stack it, it behaves as if it were a quantum function. Yeah. Uh, you know, the classic quantum functions are probability waves, of course, and, yes. and that's kind of a very abstract idea. But uh, with the Copenhagen interpretation, you, you know, the observation collapses it down. So I think it, it tracks. It tracks as a, a really... Yeah. I think vivid way of looking at it that so that you don't lose sight of the fact that it's just because of the way we're looking at it is why it, it reflects back that way. Yeah. We, and it doesn't mean the other stuff isn't there. No, we, we think that we have a subjective waveform collapse, which is basically the concepts of ego consciousness or what it's focusing on, which might be a theory, for example. So the, 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 the wider objective waveform, not the wave function, but the waveform of representation of information is yeah. collapsed subjectively. And that might be into a theory or it might be to something else. But if you can expand out of that collapsed state, then you can learn a great deal more because you know that you're focusing and you're not therefore then reducing. Right. Yeah, it helps you avoid a lot of reductive errors. It does, yeah. So in, in the spirit of getting down into the nitty gritty of the biology then, recognizing that it's not just that, but what is the biological theory, um, I think the easiest way for me to, to frame the way it, it's developing now, a, as I see it, is that from the genome comes adaptations. And that includes the Panksepian affective centers. So uh, they're not, they're, adapta they're, they're adaptive, but they're not like specific adaptation for a particular thing necessarily. They're more like global states that tend to work pretty good in lots of situations like rage works when you're under attack, not every time. And it's not always necessary, but you know what I mean? It's, um, it's kind of a general response to, you know, heavyweight problems require heavyweight solutions. So we're just going to crank that in there and see what happens. Um, but then the genome also creates the imagination and memory centers that you would see associated with the default mode network, for example. Uh, a lot of new, really inter interesting stuff coming out about the, um, the science of spontaneous thought. A lot of it in neuroscience is revolving around the default mode. I know you guys talk about that sometimes. So, but I think that part 
is taking in the information that we get from the senses, you, you know, informed by the Panksepian centers uh, and in terms of affective color, as it were, to then create archetypal elements and that leads to archetypal images. Yeah. Um, so uh, things like the hero's journey, the initiation story form that we talked about with the initiation dream video, uh, the divine mother, all that kind of stuff are like kind of the, the downstream effects of all of that stuff. And that's how I see it. And I, I think it, it's parallel to the way you all describe it, maybe using some different terminology, but. Very close. I, I think they're probably the same. <laughs> yeah, I think they probably are too. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're making the same observations, slightly different language, but I don't think that's a problem at all. Um, no. We use dialectical syncretism, for example, as a of course. way of looking at approaches and understanding different languages. That really helps to translate. So we have a Rosetta Stone. Right, right. Um, my my view of how the ego plays into this is that it is also a construction of the genome that has a specific function too. Um, you know, the, the ego, it, sometimes we forget about this, that the, the self and the genome creates the ego for a purpose. It's not just there to just vibe, you know, and just kind of chillax or whatever it is that we think that we're supposed to be doing uh, with the ego. No, I think that evolved uh, in the primate, you know, order and probably other species as well, um, to utilize the powers that, uh, that conscious thought and free will bring to the table. So those are, I think, products of the genome. It's, it, it might be a bit unusual to think of that. Um, I know there's a lot of scientists out there. I don't know about a lot, but at least some like maybe Daniel Dedden, for example, who was very deterministic mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, he looks at that that way. Did I lose you? Yeah, um, am I back? <laughs> oh, okay. I don't know what happened. <laughs> I got the Daniel down it, so it's just a just a small glitch, I think. Okay. Okay, just a glitch. So what I was saying is that um, there's folks like him that would argue that free will doesn't exist and all that stuff. If you set aside those objections and you say, okay, free will clearly exists because you know we perceive it, and then what's the point of it? Um, and my, my argument would be that it's there to integrate and adapt to life in a way that the genome might not necessarily be able to do with just reflexive reactions, as it were. Yeah. Uh, it's another way that the genome uses plasticity to accommodate survival and to achieve survival ends. Plasticity is something in the genome uh, that's throughout biology, you can see uh, an easy example of that would be um, when you exercise, your muscles get bigger, All right? Same genome, different phenotype. Yeah. But the plasticity of the phenotype is not random or arbitrary. It's based on the needs of the organism in the moment. And I think the, the development of the conscious ego is the latest um, creation or, I guess, invention of the genome in the 3.5 billion years it's been around to say, how, how can I create something that will accommodate lots of different possible things that life might throw at me, right? That's kind of how I see it. So it's supposed to be in line with the genome, but of course it can, it's so flexible and so plastic, it can go on all kinds of weird directions that are completely useless. <laughs> yeah, I, I, it seems to be, um, that's the downside of having an enlarged cerebral cortex that we can generate a very variegated neuro set of neuroses. Mm -hmm. Well, and that makes sense because, uh, you know, everything in biology, nothing's for free, right? There's nothing free in biology ever. So we have all this capability that we get from it and we inherit all these problems that come right along with it too. <laughs> uh, so, um, and the way I put it um, is that I think that of course the archetypal images are going to then be filtered through the conscious ego because that's where the confluence of energy kind of focuses in it's a highly integrative center when it's working properly yeah. uh, when it's not working properly you get schizophrenia and all kinds of things bipolar disorder um, but i guess the the end the the point of it is that if if this is the way i put it in my latest paper if the biopsychosocial influence on us is a game then biology creates the board sets up the pieces and writes the rules but we can still play it any way we want to. 
but that's how it, how it is. Because a lot of times you'll see this in papers where they say things like, um, ex, you know, our experiences are a combination of genome and environment, or everything is a combination of these three. And that's technically true, but it doesn't really tell us very much. I mean, what isn't that? So my, my latest mission more has been to say, to what extent does biology uh, run the show versus these other elements, you know, because culture makes a huge impact, especially in humans. But of course, humans aren't the only animals that have culture. And then of course, the psychology, right? We do, do, we still have free will and we can still do what we wish to do, even against the instincts or against culture or all these things we can choose to do otherwise. So how does that play in? Um, so I know I've talked about kind of more the nuts and bolts of my biology, biological theory of archetypes on the, on the channels, but I wanted to kind of get into some of the objections that have been around for a while now. And some of them keep getting perpetuated, much to my consternation. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so. Inherit an age of ignorance, I believe uh, Goethe says. What's that? A <laughs> great man inherits an age of ignorance. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, yeah. He's uh, he was a smart guy, and he knew some things. Um. So one of the ones that I run into is scholars who are, are debating with me or engaging with this topic, not necessarily to do with me, but just exploring it. Will say, "Hey, look, there's all this data that shows that the genome responds to experience." Oh, okay. So that must mean that archetypes aren't genetic. That, 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 doesn't, that doesn't work like that. <laughs> um, like I was saying earlier, I mean, genomes are supposed to respond to experience. That's their whole purpose. But a human genome will have a number of responses set up in advance, just like an, a, a fish will respond to water. And if you take it out of the water, it's going to be confused and lost because the genome is saying, where's the water, <laughs> you know? So yeah, of course it responds to experience, but that doesn't, that doesn't explain away the idea of inherited archetypal structures or, or instincts in the least. So I think that's just, that objection really comes about from a, a lack of understanding of biology and genetics. It's kind of a superficial understanding, a view that if something must be a genetic means that it has to emerge independent of environment completely. But as we know, there's no such thing. Nothing arrives independent of the environment. Um, but nothing emerges independent of the genome either. That's my point. Even learning and culture and all that kind of stuff, they're still products of the genome. Ultimately, if we were to say, like Jung says, that culture is human nature, which I strongly agree with, then we've got to remember, yes, but human nature comes from the human genome. Otherwise, we're not talking about human nature. We're talking about gorilla nature or bee nature or duck nature. See, and so, yes, we can respond to culture individually uh, in all sorts of different ways, but that doesn't mean that that proceeds independently of the genetic influence because we still need the genome to say, learn this. <laughs> Learn that, right? Don't learn this. Ignore that. That's exactly how it works. So um, there's, there's another objection, which I, I call the structural anthropology objection. I don't know if you've heard of this. Yeah. Um, have you, so it kind of goes back to Levi Strauss. <laughs> yeah. That's where you, I think you can trace this back. Now, Levi, I've actually published on this uh, subject, um, the comparison of Jung with Levi Strauss and Jung with uh, Levi Bruhl. And these guys and um, Levi Strauss didn't like Jung, <laughs> so he I think deliberately wrote in a way to try to exclude his ideas, um, and consciously or not, I'm not sure. Uh, I never met the man, so who knows? But it other scholars have observed that he it seemed like he was describing things that were very similar to what Jung was saying, but he would frame it in such a way so it's like no, but not Jung, right? Not that. <laughs> so what he would do is say that um, the reason why, for example, um, if you ask the question, like, why are there so many uh, similarities in marriage rituals around the world? And he would say that 
or at least the structural anthropology objection says the similarities emerge from similar problems. So there's a need for uh, people to break away from their family and get together and, and marry and create a new family. And so the rituals are there to design that it has nothing to do with the genome. So I don't know if you heard it, objections yeah. like this before. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm broadly familiar with these, yes. Yeah. I, I um, regard that what's, as a, your, what's your response to that? Well, I, I would regard that as a product of his discipline and then his personality filtered through his discipline and the times in which he lived. Um, and then without uh, making it an argumentum ad hominem, I, I would say that's probably all there is to that because it's moving so far away from being objective that it's only personal. And you get a lot of this, obviously, in, in uh, the psychological uh, theories, uh, mm -hmm. under whichever colour, including anthropology, because when they make an interpretation of human nature, it becomes, it, it transitions into psychology because they're doing that. They're on common ground. So, yeah, I, I've, I've, heard, I've heard a lot of that, and um, it doesn't really impress me because it doesn't move out of its frame. Right. It doesn't travel. If that explanation traveled into biology, I'd have a respect for it, but it doesn't that well. And the thing that used to impress me about Jung was is that to me, when I was younger, it, he did appear to travel well. You could move him into most disciplines and he'd have something to say and there would be yeah. ground. So I thought, this guy travels well. I'll listen to him. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with that. Uh, I mean, Jung wasn't perfect. Perfect, and his writing is sometimes very frustrating. But he was fearless. I mean, he would go anywhere and try anything, and oh, yeah. try it on for size, and try to make sense of it. And so that was that was a great thing that of, yeah. of his. Um, my uh, objection to this, okay, so in the late '90s, there was a guy named um, Peter Kanan, a Finnish scholar, who basically re repackaged this objection and uh, submitted it to the Journal of Analytical Psychology. And it was a really interesting article because he was saying, hey, you know, he's repeating Levi Strauss's argument, but a little bit more sophisticated manner. But it was the same same thing, saying that similar situations create similar solutions. And that's that. There's nothing genetic or biological about this. Uh, Anthony Stevens chimed in as one of the responders to this, along with George Hoganson and a number of other folks. Um, and this and this has been repeated more recently uh, by some more recent scholars too. So I'm looking at this just from the point of biology and saying, like you say, trying to take an objective position and say, okay, the problem with this argument is that it doesn't rule out genetic influence just because you say it does. Yeah. Okay, maybe it doesn't need it or maybe it does, who knows? Either way, you haven't addressed it once whatsoever. Yeah. And, and my counter example to this would be um, walking. Okay, so every culture known, we have to solve the similar problem of how do we get around? Now, um, if this argument were to make sense, then there should be cultures out there where everyone cartwheels everywhere they go, <laughs> yeah. right? Or they crawl on all fours everywhere they go. Why do those not exist? Because even though the problem is the same and the solution is the same, there is still a genetic influence that says we're going to pick this specific solution over these others. And of course, our biology and our evolution, <clears throat> we come from upright walking primates um, who stopped walking on all fours around 7 million years ago and decided over the course of 2 million years, they evolved into an organism that walked up upright. Yeah. And so we inherited that and our entire physiology is set up around that. If you, if you, when you study anatomy, you, one of the things that really impressed me about this in medical school was just how specific our physiology is to upright posture. Yeah. Right. So the blood pressure, the, the, the nerves, um, you know, all of that stuff, the valves, everything. So all of those things say, yeah, we all have the same similar problem, but this is the solution that you're going to pick <laughs> and because it's the one we just naturally fall into because of all of these, all of these different processes working at the same time. So this, this objection makes no sense then in that case. Yeah, totally agree. But one, one thing that I would do is a force experiment. Um, and I encourage our students to think like this across the board in, in a clinical sense 
would be this. It's a false experiment. It would, it would be that if the genome were present at the level of an anthropological level of analysis, then how would it express and how would we know that it was there? Insofar as if it were removed, something would go wrong for the anthropological level of analysis. Mm-hmm. So it, if uh, Jungian archetypes are biological, they will have a register of expression which will be detectable by anthropology. They'll pick up the signal and they will interpret it that way. Then, okay, let, let's find out what that would look like and then let's remove biology. What happens to the signal? The signal will vanish. Uh, and given that biology comes first, it must do, phylogenetically, ontogenetically, then it has that ontogenetic priority. Uh, and therefore it is contributing, but the signal is perhaps hidden if we collapse only into an anthropological level of analysis. So th- that would be similar to my thought experiment about walking then. If I remove the genome, then, yeah. right? That I remove the genome, then there should be cultures where everyone cartwheels everywhere they go. Yeah. Uh, they run around flapping their arms like chickens for some unknown reason. Hey, absolutely. Right? <laughs> but we don't see that. We don't see that. No, no, we don't. Just like we don't... Um, you know, we've got hero's journeys, we've got initiations, and they all have these very similar stories. We've got alchemical symbolism that's you can see all over the world. And that's all, it's all orchestrated by the genome, which creates the board and the pieces and the rules. <laughs> and so there's only so many solutions, but you can still pick one. Yeah. Uh, that, that's one counter example to this structural objection. So th- I've got two more, actually. Another one is that... Um, it, you know, that counter argument sounds good on the surface, but when you start looking at specific examples, it feels like it breaks down. And, and here's the one I use a lot is um, if you look at cultures in, uh, if you look at ancient Viking culture, there's cultures in Indonesia that were studied by anthropologists in the last century. And there's also um, cultures in the Pacific Northwest of the U.S., the Tlingit clan, for example, all three of these extremely widespread, far-flung cultures have a process where if someone dies, you have to open up a hole in the house, take them through the hole, take them to where they're going to buried, they're going to be buried, close up the hole so that the spirit can't come back into the house or find its way back in. Same narrative, same ritual, same rationale is given for these. So, if it, okay, what problem are they solving with that specific solution, and why does it have to be that specific? You know, it just seems like if there wasn't any genetic influence here, again, with I like your thought experiment idea, it's great. Take the genome out of here, this makes no sense. Oh, it just falls apart, nothing, it, it's just a wild, amazing coincidence with no explanation. Yeah, like, mm, sorry. Uh, and the third one is that. Um, actually, when I was working on uh, Neurobiology of the Gods, I came across some interesting studies where they looked at co-reared individuals uh, who were not related to each other, but were reared together in various uh, different, like uh, there's Israeli kibbutzim and there's some uh, like royal families in the Southeast Asia. And they found that um, those individuals have an aversion to mating later in life, a very strong, like visceral reaction to like, Ugh. You know, kind of like you would feel about your sister or your brother, right? <laughs> and so the question that the, the um, investigators were looking at is, is that an adaptation to avoid incest relations? And it seems like it is. It, it seems like, because, um, again, a genetic, um, a genetic predisposition will just pick a particular element of the environment and move from there, whatever it is that's associated with the adaptation. So in this case, it seems as though if you spend a significant amount of time with someone as a child, as a small child, you'll be averse to mating with them later in life, whether they're related to you or not. And that will solve the problem and down the road with potential too much incestuous mixing of genetic material, which leads to problems. So in that case, we've got direct evidence if, if they're correct, then that would be gr- direct evidence that the genome is making a major part in incest taboos all around the world. Yeah. And one of the, and of course, at the inception that proves the rule is that you've got mythologies where the, the brother and the sister are, are together as deities. But of course, the thing about that is that that applies to gods. 
yeah. right? Not humans. <laughs> and most societies that believe in, in deities and divine figures make a pretty strong distinction there. So I don't think it's fair to, to look at this mythology and say, how does that apply? It's like, it does. It does apply in the right context, in the religious context. But in the day-to-day -day interactions, the taboo is there. Again, remove the genome. What do you, what do you get? That, that makes no sense. Why is that there? Yeah, well, so, it would uh, aid adaptive radiation, wouldn't it, as well, uh, to cause people to move away from their own extended family. And so, exactly. Yeah, that would be good. Also, I think that's really strong evidence for what we call meta instincts in the sense that it is anticipated as a consequence genetically, but we don't become fully conscious of that. We will become conscious probably of an affect charge, a panxepian kind of affect consciousness, mm -hmm. rather than the thing in and of itself which pushes us away. And later, then there's an emergence of a narrative that explains that. But the right. narrative is probably latent anyway, um, and then emerges as a scenario. Because one thing that we found with panxep is that they're definitely real, the Panxapian affects and instincts, uh, but they can fire without a context. And when they do, then people suffer. Oh, yeah. so they require a context. And once they've got one, people generally feel more adapted. So the mm -hmm. idea of a context is probably genetic and therefore mm -hmm. rehearsal and anticipation of these contexts emerging and the Panxapian instincts then align behind that. Whereas Jung's complexes seem to be capable of generating a pseudo meta instinctive co uh, context, um, which can be based on a pathological version of fantasy, which seems to satisfy Pansep, not fully, but enough as a whole. Yeah. And if it's hung on to for too long, then of course the person becomes maladaptive, instincts pressure again, and they, they release further fantasies to get around the locked-in fantasy that the person's entrapped within. So again, more evidence for meta instincts. I, I think that's, that's a really good explanation. Mm. Yeah, and, and what you just, just described, the way that the psyche behaves in that manner would not make any sense if, uh, if we didn't look at it as, as a consequence of the genome because biology behaves just like that. It's, yeah. it, it comes up with solutions that are good enough and it'll come up with another, uh, you know, like side process that is ideally going to blend in with the late other processes and it'll get you where you need to go, but it doesn't always happen. It's not hundred percent. It's, it's been, it's biology, right? It's, it's not an exact sort of thing. It's not inevitable. Um, and like you were saying, the, uh, the Panksepian affective power, you know, drives, um, they, uh, they absolutely can happen in no context because, again, that's good enough. It'll get you where you need to go more often than not. But then the answer to that, I think, is that the genome, uh, at whatever point in our evolution, decided that a conscious ego is a great adaptation to help facilitate the contextualizing of those ancient, ancient emotional centers. And that's, again, that's how evolution works. It, it piles on stuff that's already there. Right. It doesn't have to create any, it never creates things completely whole cloth out of nothing. It, it's just not, doesn't work that way. It'll, it'll take what it has and then just pile on more stuff. <laughs> yeah. And it's on a clock as well, isn't it? it it's on a developmental clock and mm. things that mean something downstream of a certain age don't before that age. Uh, so the genome has a kind of consciousness it's appropriate over time. It's not ego consciousness, but it, it has an understanding, as you say, interacted with the environment. And then it really well, it has an intent. Yeah. It has an intentionality. It's got for, you know, final causality and all that stuff. So in that sense, definitely. So it, it will re release behaviors to rehearse a context that's not fully understood uh, at an early age, but it, it forces or it compels through panxepian instincts to rehearse these and then it releases the context and it matches up uh, and we would say that information that's super positioned latently in the genome yeah. we get a bit of it in ego consciousness and then suddenly it's in the environment and the whole thing lines up and it's in all of those places simultaneously in a resonant form well and the what you say about it being at different levels of analysis also applies to different points in time too yes. Time is another dimension that works in a similar way to the spatial dimension. So you could say that it's there in the future 
in in that nascent form. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, why do um, species uh, that do a lot of heavy predation or um, interspecies conflict over mates have so much play activity early on? Well, they're, they're practicing. Yeah, and like you pointed out in one of our other videos, uh, the kid, the the children who play act fighting each other, and one of them will sacrifice themselves for the others, and it's all fun and games. But that's it's play and fun and games in that moment, but it's teaching you. It's, it's there because you got to learn the stuff. Also, the anticipation of the hero cycle. I, I, I yeah. uh, it has embedded within it in a dramatic narrative form the rehearsal of uh, sacrifice and then the idea of rebirth. It's all in there. So you, there are multiple things being dealt with and, and played out, literally played, as you say, in that moment. But maybe we're not ready for it. And then when we are, mm. the specific genes express and well, I'm a different person. <laughs> well, and right. And that uh, just going back to the aversion, uh, that co-reared individuals aversion, yeah. all the individual feels in the moment is the aversion. They don't get the context or the why. And it's, I think sometimes we just that's what we get as conscious, the conscious ego. We get the affect, but we don't know why it's there. And so to a degree in, in therapy, sometimes it's just trusting that those emotions have some kind of point yeah. to them. It, as long as we can identify that, if we can identify that it's just there for no good reason, right? If it's un decontextualized, like you say. And so that, that's some of the fine, fine tuning work in therapy is figuring that out. Yeah. But sometimes it is there because it's pulling you in a direction you kind of need to go, right? Like a, like a compass, the genome yeah. says, go that way. Yeah. Why? Just go that way. <laughs> It'll work out. Trust me. <laughs> yeah, and that, at least that's how it appears to the conscious ego, right? If, if we project onto it like a, a godlike figure or a Senex or, you know, wise man in the woods, all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, yeah, the yeah, wise yeah. grandmother, that kind of thing. Thank you. They're narrative explanations, aren't they, for what we're feeling, as you say, in another way. Uh, and I don't see them as being different. I just see them as as local collapses of a much bigger waveform which of course involves the genome intimately um, mm. that allows us to move through life and, and we see things represented in different ways but, but when i think people say collapse into one level of resolution and then do not see outside of that that's when you start to get maladaptations and mm. if people for example um, follow a Jungian influenced path and they become religious in a you know, a, an inflated way, then they yeah. lose contact with their biology completely and they start not to fulfill the task of life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, and that's what's so mystifying about all those objections to the biological theory. Um, now, I would say that not all of the objections are coming from that headspace. Um, some of them are just trying to make sure we don't reduce everything to biology. And that's fair. And I've always said that. Uh, even from the very first papers that I've been, you know, embroiled in these conversations is I'm not saying that we can, that we can or should reduce absolutely everything to biology, but the same the same goes for the psychology too. We can't just pretend like it isn't there and say, well, everything's a combination of gene and environment. Therefore we can just kind of do whatever we want to, which is kind of, you know, the attitude I feel like I get sometimes, um, you know, uh, so there's two other lines of, of objection that I wanted to share with you and let's get your thoughts. Um, one of them here, James has actually helped me some with, um, with his background in, in genetics. And uh, this is the, the one that started around 10, now, getting on 12 years ago now with uh, actually longer than that, with uh, Gene Ox's work um, saying that the gene, the human genome, this was, first formulated in around the early 2000s, actually, saying, okay, we got 24,000 genes in the human genome. That's insufficient for symbolic information. I know I've complained about this before on the channel. Um, and that was, of course, the, in the heyday of junk DNA, thinking there's all this DNA that doesn't, doesn't do anything. It's just junk, yeah. uh, we know, which we know is not true now. Um, so, I, and, and yet, and yet I hear this pop up every once in a while still, today this objection that how can genomes generate archetypes if there's only 24,000 genes on the human genome 
And I, I've shared this with this with James and, you know, he just sort of like goes, what does that have to do with, it? <laughs> you know, and I'm like, yeah, I know. Right. But um, the counter argument to that, in my opinion, is number one, um, there's about 20,000 regulatory centers of the genome that don't produce proteins, but they create molecules that regulate the production of the other proteins. And so that's actually 20,000 more genes there. Right. And then what James did is he helped, he helped me to nail down. I already knew that there was splice variants of all those genes too. Uh, I don't know if you know what that is, but uh, each gene in, in the human so genome. James and yourself would understand it, but familiar at a conceptual level. Yeah, yeah. And each gene can be spliced into multiple different variations, depending on what the genome needs at the moment, which is highly sensitive to the environment. Um, but on average, the human gene, every human gene has on an average about three different variants that are used at any one given time. So where are we at now? We've got 45,000 genes. Each one of those has an average of three variants. Okay, so we're, we're way up there now. Now, of course, does that, does that mean that's enough? Well, that's another problem. How many is enough? <laughs> yeah. All right, nobody's answered that. And yet here we are making these bold statements about it. Yeah. It's not cool. I think, but I think, I think the idea behind it is that each one gene corresponds yeah. to one trait. And if we only have 24,000, then we can only have 24,000 traits. That doesn't make any sense. I think the, the, the sort of uh, the point of delivery response or answer to that is that uh, we have enough for what we have to do. Otherwise, we couldn't do it. So we have to solve the problem on the basis of what we know we have. And if we find we have more, that's only interesting. Yes, yes. <laughs> that, I mean, that's the simplest explanation. That's what I offered way back in 2010 when I first heard it. Well, it, it's, it's, it's solid. It's solid. Like clearly 24,000 or 20 is enough to get the job done and create so much complexity yeah. in the human form, you know, and there's other species that have even fewer genes and they're, they're very complex too. So uh, that, that one is very outdated. I really wish people would quit repeating it and I'm going to keep fussing about it until I don't hear it anymore. <laughs> yeah, gone it. <laughs> um, and so then the last one, the last one I'll share with you is evidence from newborns. Another one that, um, that Knox compiled a, a number of studies on newborns and said, if we look at the neural structure of the newborn and their behavioral capacity and all that, it's very primitive. Their, their brains are very primitive and simple. And, and so how in the world can they have um, any sort of like archetypes or hero's journey or anything like that in, in a nascent form as a newborn? Um, now, my, my counter argument to that is they're using birth as an arbitrary cutoff for development, right? As you've observed, there's a time factor here. There's a delay, like this will kick in when you're 12, right? All of a sudden you're gonna get a testosterone surge at this age, right? And this happens all across the animal kingdom, humans too. So why in the heck are we looking at newborns for hero's journey structures? They don't need them when they're newborns, right? That makes no sense. No, it doesn't. It, it, or we would be born as adults, which we're not. Yeah, and clearly we're not. And we can't just say that. Oh, it's you know, once you're once you're born, everything that happens afterward is due to culture and has nothing to do with the genome. Now, it's been pointed out to me that Knox didn't say that specifically, and I'm like, no, but strongly implies it that everything before birth is nurture is nature, and everything after that is nurture. But that's garbage. That, that doesn't fly. Otherwise, the, the, the zygote would have a fully functioning nervous system. Right? It doesn't work like it's got to develop. It's, give it some time, people. <laughs> um, I think you know, so. if you look at studies of children who are like studies of children's dreams, um, narrative images with self symbolism don't really appear until around age seven. I said, just storytelling. I just say, Professor, I, I remember and I recorded as a child before that age my dreams, and a lot of them do have a narrative structure. I can well, I'm talking about averages, right? You're yeah, sure. You're probably, well, what I'm saying you're probably is, above average. <laughs> well, maybe, but 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 the the point being that the narrative structure for some people is there. You know, it, it's there, yeah. and it's not been learned. Right. Exactly. So, so how did that work? Exactly. It, so it must be innate. I didn't learn this. I, I mean, to be quite honest, my parents were not the most literate 
of people or, or imaginative. Uh, if Pauline were here, she'd confirm that uh, uh, of people at all. I had a very different experience, and I think it's because I was on a different clock. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the genome, in your case, just had the right combination and said, okay, this is going to be your path. Yeah, I think, I think it did. It, it caused a lot of problems because it was a mismatch of my environment and you have a, a choice of basic responses there, left or right, one of which is just give in and, and deny yourself and the other is I can't <laughs> because right. something is not allowing me to do it. Right. Yeah, yeah. So uh, the presence at birth is, is meaningless in this process. Yeah, totally. know, getting back to the main question is... Um, now, did you have environmental input along the way? Yes, but it's not like you were repeating things verbatim that you heard to create these narrative structures. No, the psyche took, took the environment, rearranged it into these structures, yes. which is what they do with dreams. That's, we, we do this as adults throughout our entire life. Yeah. Uh, dreams aren't this is where the day residue idea comes in. You know, like Freud identified that there's always this day residue where well, that's true, but it's never a verbatim repeat of what happened to you unless you're talking about trauma, then it is. But then that's malfunctioning, right? <laughs> well, it's not even malfunctioning really, but it's just, it's a very specific case. When you're not in, in that situation, it takes what happened to you during that day and over the last week or so breaks it up into pieces and then reorganizes into these new stories. That's where the, the innate part comes that You have influenced my thinking on Pauline's very, very profoundly over much of the work that you did with neurobiology of the gods. And as we always try to do, we, we try to look for evidence in the lives of other people, people that mm. we work with, that we're privileged to work with. And yep, yeah, it was there. And we go, oh, this is interesting. And it was able to we were able to make sense of things outside of the more usual collapse into a Jungian archetypal model. So yeah, we'll, we'll be forever grateful for, for the, the work that you've done. Oh, well, glad. I'm glad. It's, it's great to see uh, people appreciating all the work I put into that. Well, <laughs> yeah, I just, I was, I wrote it in sort of a fever dream. I was so intensely into it, oh. but um so yeah, that's that's where I'm at these days. Uh, I think we've got a lot more work we can do to connect the dots in terms of what we know about how genomes behave, adaptations, plasticity, phenotypic, uh, you know, behaviors, and all that stuff. And how does that apply to the psyche? How does that apply to the self? Uh, it's exciting, exciting work. Oh, amazing! Yeah, it's great. It's worth getting up for in the morning. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. And, you know, maybe that's, that's the path, you know, that, that fits. And, and that's why it feels like that, that the seeking system kicks in and says, yep, that's where you're supposed to be doing. So do it. <laughs> Roger that. Absolutely. <laughs> very good. Very good. Well, that's what I got today. Well, it was great. Uh, I, I really enjoy Alistair's Pauline uh, talking with you. It's, it's, it's always a wonderful experience for us. And of course, it's a great benefit to our students. So, yeah, wonderful. And uh, I'm really glad to help. Speak yep. again. It'd be, be amazing. All right. Well, we'll see you next time then. Great. Thank you.